like a podcast. If the first two minutes of a podcast are really boring, if I come on the show and I go, uh, yeah, it's good to be here tomorrow. Everyone's going to be like, I don't listen to this. Like, what in the world is this? So it's the same thing with the conclusion. If you do such a great job, but the last two minutes, people don't leave with a clear takeaway, they won't really know what to do after the presentation. Welcome to Pivoting Pharmacy with Nutrigenomics, part of the Pharmacy Podcast Network, a must-have resource for pharmacist entrepreneurs seeking to enhance patient care while enjoying career and life. Join us as we pivot into nutrigenomics using pharmacy and nutrition for true patient-focused care. Explore how to improve chronic conditions rather than just manage them. Celebrate entrepreneurial triumphs and receive priceless advice. Align your values with a career that profoundly impacts patients. Together, we'll raise the script on health and pivot into a brighter future. Hello and welcome to Pivoting Pharmacy with Nutrigenomics. I'm Dr. Tamar Lawful, Doctor of Pharmacy and Certified Nutritional Genomics Specialist. How many of you remember having to do a presentation in front of your class in college? Were you nervous? I don't know about you, but I sure was. And then I recall when I interviewed for my PGY1 pharmacy residency and had to do a presentation in front of my potential future preceptors. I mean, it had been nine years since I had graduated from pharmacy college and I had been working as a pharmacist already. So why in the world was I sweating from every pore of my body during this presentation? Well, if you were tired of feeling nervous, and unprepared when speaking to patients or colleagues and want to become a more confident and effective communicator in your pharmacy practice, you're going to love this episode. Join me as I chat with Brendan Kumarasamy on how to transform your public speaking skills. Brendan is the founder of Master Talk. He coaches ambitious executives and entrepreneurs to become top 1% communicators in their industry. He also has a popular YouTube channel called Master Talk with the goal of providing free access to communication tools for everyone in the world. Brendan believes that Quote, the next Elon Musk is a seven-year-old girl who can't afford a communication coach. So it's my duty to help her succeed with my free resources. End of quote. So are you ready to discover proven techniques to quickly boost your communication confidence and learn easy ways to prepare for patient questions and relate better to any audience? Then listen in. Brendan, thank you for joining us on Pivoting Pharmacy with Nutrigenomics. I want to dive just right in with learning a little bit about you and how you got to where you are today. For sure, Tamar. Thanks for having me on the show. It's great to be here. So yeah, the short story on me is all started in college. Funny enough, I studied in accounting, which has nothing to do with what I do today because I thought I was going to be a numbers guy. Mm -hmm. And then while I'm studying this degree in accounting tomorrow, I start competing in these things called case competitions. Think of it like professional sports, but for nerds. So while other guys my age were playing rugby or football or soccer or some other sport, you probably wouldn't see me playing. I did case competitions, which Mm -hmm. is like presentations competitively. And then as I got older, I was coaching a lot of the students in college and how to speak. And I realized that everything I was sharing with them wasn't really available on the internet. So I started making videos on social media. I called it Master Talk. And then a few years later, it turned into what it is today. So why did you focus on communication coaching for professionals per se? The reason I focused on communication, I was just really good at it. I think that was the main idea. Well, actually, I was terrible at it when I was younger. I I have a physical disability in my left arm. I spoke my whole life in a second language because I'm from Montreal Mm -hmm. and you need to know how to speak French. And there's a great quote from Gay Hendricks who says, like, always follow your zone of excellence, right? Focus on something that you're really talented in that brings you joy. And coaching was always in my blood tomorrow. I just never knew it was a profession. So when I was in college, I wasn't charging anyone for coaching. I was just helping them speak because I said, okay, no one's helping them. Then when I started Master Talk, which is mostly just a hobby at the beginning, because I got a great job at IBM in their consulting division. So I worked there for a few years before I went full time. And it was nine months into the business. I met my business partner, Vamsi, and he's the one who said, hey, you know, executives would pay you a bunch of money to work with you. And I said, really? And that's what started the business. And I never looked back ever since. Awesome. So in your experience, what do you find is the biggest challenge when it comes to public speaking? A lot of people tomorrow answer with fear. I think there's a bigger challenge than fear. 
and it's consistency. A lot of us, when we think about going to the gym, when we think about working on any skills, the reason we get better is not because we're experts in the topic, it's because we're consistent with it. So we'll go to the workout twice a week, we'll have a personal trainer work with us, we'll go to yoga classes, and it's that consistency that breeds results. But in our case with communication, one, it's really hard, and we'll solve that today, it's really hard to figure out, like, what are we actually practicing on a weekly basis? What can we actually work towards? And the second piece, especially with healthcare professionals, if they have a really busy life, either they're doing the residency while they're still in college or when they're on the job, they have so many different patients to deal with. How do you make the time to even work on speaking? So there's no easy set of steps to actually get this. Well, there is, but I mean, like in, in general, most people don't really know what those things are. And I feel that's the biggest challenge to overcome. It's gaining that consistency in our communication practice. Yeah, I can see that because the more consistent you are, you get more comfortable with it. It's not something you really have to think that much about. You just do it. But before you even get to that consistency, I'm sure there are certain fears that people might have. I know for me, it's like, oh, what are people, am I going to say this right? Or what are people going to think about this message that I have? Um, have you noticed anything like that with the clients you've worked with? Absolutely, Tamar. And you know, the solution to that fear that I take, the remedy that I follow, is I always get the student to take a step back and think about a skill that they were really bad at initially that they worked towards. So a great example in the healthcare space, whether people listening are registered nurses, whether they're doctors, whether they're physiotherapists, whether they're dentists, is the first time you worked with the patient when you got started. So I'm sure there's a lot of imposters and hey, you know, there's doctors that have been in this space for 25 years. What in the world do I know about operating a patient? So what advice does faculty give to its students? Well, it's very simple. They say, you know what? The first patient, you're not going to be super amazing at it. But if you're seeing the same patient, different patients rather, every single day, and it's the same diagnosis over and over again, my gut tells me that after 100 diagnosis, diagnoses, rather, you'll be pretty confident at dealing with that patient even if it's a new person. So I like to use that analogy to communication. So the first time you're speaking, whether it's on a stage, whether it's on a podcast, whether it's in a meeting, you're thinking, oh my God, I'm not really sure. I'm really uncomfortable with this. But if we practice the same exercise a few extra times, we drill a couple of the questions that patients might ask us a few more times. My guess is in the same way we became proficient as healthcare professionals, mm -hmm. we'll do the same thing in our communication skills as well. That makes so much sense, Brendan. So it's talking about the like, communication. I'm sure there's different communication strategies. Do those strategies change in their context, depending on who that professional is talking to, like we're pharmacists mainly here, or they're a physician or a dentist, would their communication strategy change and how so? So, you know, the way I always like to simplify this, communication is like juggling 18 balls at the same time. So in the same way that let's say we take a, a pharmacist, the specific medicines that you might recommend might depend on the types of allergies that person has, how they might be prone to different side effects based on that medication. So it's really important to understand the medical history of the specific patient that you're prescribing medicine to. So we all know, and obviously you all know that a lot better than I do, but in the context of communication, it can also be very nuanced, like communication tips could change from being a physicist versus being a doctor. But there's some general pointers that work across industry. It doesn't really matter who you are, or where you come from. The tips will matter throughout. And that's what I'll teach you right now, which okay. is the three easiest balls. R, Q, V. So I'll pause after every single one. So I'm not monologuing for 10 minutes here. Okay. Yeah. So the first one is R, the random word. So all you have to do tomorrow is pick any word that you want. A leaf, flower, building, wife, light bulb, it doesn't really matter. And create a 60 second presentation out of thin air. So if you can do this, when you go back to your expertise, it's going to be really easy for you to talk about what you already know, which is pharmacy. So I'd encourage people if they have kids, do this with their kids, but really do this a few times a day and you'll get a lot better at speaking without preparation. Wow. Just one word and do a presentation. How long presentation? 
the key is not to overthink it, but okay. it's 60 seconds is a guideline, but it's really just about doing it. Because a lot of us tomorrow, we tend to overthink this exercise. We go, okay, what is the exact length if I make a mistake on this? And that's okay, because we're taught to think that way as healthcare professionals. Because if you get one detail wrong, it could jeopardize the health patient. So we're trained to be detail oriented. But in the context of communication, we have to take an opposite approach because every nuance of communication is never always going to be black and white. It's always gray. So doing the random word exercise pushes us out of our comfort zone because we can't take a structured approach to it anymore. Oh my goodness. Because as pharmacists, we are very meticulous, perfectionists. We want to get it right. So like me, my, and this is something I'm trying to walk away from. I will write everything I'm going to say down. (laughs) And I'm going to use that script. You know, and um, so I'm walking, I'm trying to walk away more from not being so scripted and just speaking freely. So I think this random word exercise would definitely be helpful for me personally, um, just to think of that word. The word that came to my mind um, was microphone. <laughs> speak of a microphone, right? So to just speak about a microphone for 60 seconds without having it pre-written and just off the top of my head, that doesn't seem that difficult. I, I think that's a great first step. I love that. And you're setting the example for people because a lot of people tomorrow, when they hear that exercise, they're scared out of their wits to even do it. So I love the energy you brought towards that exercise. And what I tell clients, and people can write this down, is we don't get points for doing the exercise well. We get points for doing the exercise a lot. So just get to 100 and you'll see a complete shift in your game. Consistency. Exactly. Going back to the biggest challenge. So that's R. Now let's go to the second step of RQV, Q, which is the question drill. So I'll tell you a story around this tomorrow. So a few years ago when I started guesting on podcasts, well, I'm a lot more articulate these days, but I think anyways, but a few years ago when I got started, I sucked. Horrible. Because I started guesting on shows, I think when I was 22 or 23 years old, it's probably five years ago at this point. Mm-hmm. And I'm getting on these shows and some guy asks me, so Brendan, where does the fear of communication come from? And I started panicking. I was like, uh, I don't really know. So I said, uh, Toronto, New York City, Tokyo, you tell me, man. I don't know where the fear comes from. <laughs> so I was really confused. I didn't really know how to do this. But I never wanted to make a mistake again in an interview. So how did I fix this tomorrow? Every single day for five minutes, I answered one question that I thought the world would ask me about my expertise. So the first day was, and I didn't know the answer to 95% of these questions six years. Now you do a really good job at like figuring out the audience and like customizing it to the specific show. But like back then it was, okay, day one, what's the vision for Master Talk? Day two is, hey, I'm introverted. What tips do you have for me? Day three is, how do you overcome your fear of communication? But here's the secret tomorrow. You do this every single day for five minutes for a year and you'll have answered 300 and 65 questions about your industry, you'll be unstoppable. And the last part to this exercise is how do we apply this to pharmacists? Really simple. Make a list of the top 10 to 20 questions you're getting asked from patients every week. Sit down on a Sunday morning while you're drinking your favorite coffee and just go, how can I answer these questions better? And if you just do that, you'll be way better at dealing with patients. I love that. Every day for five minutes. Now, when you threw in a year, At first, I was like, oh, that's excessive. But no, it makes sense because like you said, you're going to have all these questions that you are going to be well-versed in the answers for, and you're not going to stumble over answering those questions when they are asked for you because you know the answers already. You've already thought that through. Genius. Genius, Brendan. (laughs) Thanks. Thanks, Tamar. And I love that you said that because that feedback is really important because whatever you're thinking, your audience is thinking too, which is why do we do this for a year? So let me give a different approach to it. You actually don't have to. There's a different approach, which is, and pharmacists will probably implement this because they're a lot more intense. There's a lot more education that goes into being a pharmacist. So you might be able to do this, which is I actually don't practice this once a day. The way that I do this is I'm practicing it right now because you're asking me a bunch of questions right now about speaking. So that's how I practice it indirectly. But the other piece is, okay, you don't have to do it once a day, but book out 10 days of your life and do it 30 times a day. So if you do it that way, you get all your coaching done in 10 days, and then you could do it once a quarter, but you already get the skill because you've already learned it. So now it's just maintenance at that point. 
So the key is just pick the workflow that gets you to do it. So for most people, when I'm talking to a general audience, it's going to be five minutes a day. It gets, oh, it's five minutes a day. I'll do it. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Whereas for somebody like a pharmacist, I'd recommend something a little bit different. I'd change the nuance to, okay, let's commit for the next 30 days to do this. Just 30 days, do 10 questions a day, and then you'll be really good in a month and you don't have to do it anymore. I like that. I like that. And again, that theme again is consistency, that repetition, that consistency, and where my mind went to with, with the first to the random word and the question drill that we just went over is a lot of my listeners are entrepreneurs, right? They're doing non-traditional things in pharmacy. They're not at the traditional pharmacy, the way that we think of things. They've kind of went outside the box. And now they're in the position where they need to tell their patients or their clients, explain to them what I'm doing, why I'm doing it this way versus a traditional pharmacy way. These are great exercises to use so that they're comfortable in explaining that to their clients and also becoming very comfortable with their content and what they're doing as well. Love it. I totally agree to her. And I'm glad you brought that up because there's two other use cases for entrepreneurs as well for the question drill. Mm -hmm. And the random word exercise, the random word exercise is going to be, hey, when you're pitching to investors, potentially, if you're an entrepreneur, when you're signing up new customers and you're teaching them a new healthcare workflow that they hadn't really seen before because you're creating a brand new experience, then the question drill becomes, what are the 10 questions that people are asking when they're considering my service? And how do A, I answer those questions perfectly as the CEO, and B, delegate those answers to my team who's managing those calls right now? Because if they're not explaining this experience as good as I am, I am leaking cash through the bucket. Amen. So true. So what is the third one? The final step of RQV is the video message tomorrow. So I'll tell you a story around video. And I know this scares the holy bejeebies out of healthcare professionals, but let me give the frame. So the frame is really simple. For the entrepreneurs, the sell is actually pretty easy, which is this. What I do every year is I take a list of 100, my top 100, 200 clients tomorrow, give or take. Business partners, they could be family, friends, and my Google calendar, which is actually just on my other screen here, is it'll tell me whose birthday it is. So I don't have to remember any of these birthdays because there's too many at this point. And then what I do is I put a funky birthday hat on that I bought for 15 bucks on Amazon. It's really useful, actually. I put it on my head. I open my phone and I send them a video message a few days leading up to their birthday on their birthday. The details don't really matter that much. I've even sent birthday messages two weeks late. Hey, guess whose birthday was two weeks ago? People still love it. And what happens? The video isn't perfect. I'm making a ton of mistakes. It doesn't look super great. And I get a ton of referrals from that. But most importantly, I get a ton of goodwill. Wow, I get so many texts on my birthday. I've never received a birthday video message in my life. So if you're an entrepreneur listening to this, and I know in this industry, people are, don't want to do these videos. Let me spin it differently. If you're the only person on this podcast who's an entrepreneur and who decides to do that with your patients, though there might be confidential things that I wouldn't know of. So that's a separate issue. But assuming this is possible, you'd be the only practitioner doing this and you would stand out and get so much loyalty from your clients. That is so true. That is so true. No one does that. Well, you do that, but I've never gotten a video message. <laughs> <for> <laughs> happy birthday. So yeah, you'll definitely be memorable and relatable, likable but for whatever specialty you're in. They're going to remember, oh, Dr. So-and-so, a pharmacist so-and-so sent me that birthday message and they have a pretty cool service. Why don't you check them out, friend? Ding, ding. Right. Exactly. I love ding, that. Ding. And you mentioned something that I absolutely love. You said that even your birthday video messages, it's not perfect. You might mess up. You might stumble over words. It's okay. And I think sometimes, especially when it comes to video, we get so caught up with having no mistakes and perfection. That's okay. Communication doesn't have to be perfect. It's communication. And that video message brings another touch of familiarity and personableness, if that's a word, to those that we're speaking to. Absolutely. That's really the key tomorrow. And the most important point that I'll say on this podcast has nothing to do with RQV. It's more about, are we scheduling RQV in our calendar? So what does that look like? So for the next 30 days, if you want to get the ROI from listening to this podcast today, it's, hey, did I book five minutes? However you want to play this. If it's five minutes a day, it's five minutes a day. If it's 30 minutes a week where you just block 30 minutes on a Sunday and do it, that's fine too. But where are you implementing RQV in your week? And if you're even doing it a little bit, 
let's put it another way, Tamar. I have yet to meet somebody, especially in healthcare, I've yet to meet somebody who has DM'd me on social media and said, you know, Brendan, I actually implemented RQV and I got such great results from doing this because most of us are afraid to do it. But if you just start, then you'll be fine. I think that's the key. Just do it. Just do it. Now, I want to bring it down a little bit. I feel like right now we're talking broad, right? You're talking to maybe a larger audience or when we're coming to communication or the setting. I want to bring it into my presentations. As pharmacists, we do a lot of presentations. How can we effectively present our ideas when we have these presentations and be comfortable doing it? So building on RQV, these exercises will really help you get better, especially Q when you're being asked questions. If you practice that question drill and you start to reflect, huh, what kind of questions are they going to ask me about this presentation? What have they asked me before about this presentation? And you start to reflect on those answer, you're going to be way better in Q&A. But now let's talk about the actual presentation. Let's keep it really simple today. There's a lot of different frameworks we can go into, like tree and whatnot, that I'm happy to go into. But the easiest one to implement is puzzle. So communication is a lot like jigsaw puzzle. You know those toys we used to play as kids where you got like a thousand pieces and you put them all together? Right. So if I asked you tomorrow, it's a very simple question. If you're working on this puzzle, which pieces do you start with first and why? The big pieces, because they're easy, or the ones that have the same colors because it's clear that they go together. I love that. I love that, Tamar. They're the big pieces, the ones with color. A lot of people answer the edges because they're easier right. to find too. So all of these are great answers. But the key that we're driving from your answer is you'll start with the obvious thing first. Right. So let's go with the edges. Let's say that's the obvious thing. So edges, then you work your way around. Why am I bringing that up? Because unfortunately in communication tomorrow, we don't start with the obvious. We start with the unobvious. We start at the middle. We shove a bunch of content in our presentation. We get to the presentation. Then we ramble throughout the whole thing. And then the last slide sounds like this. Uh, yeah, so thanks. <laughs> Not really the right <laughs> approach. So instead, what you want to do is apply puzzle. Start with the edges first, meaning the next time you have a presentation, just practice the first two minutes of your speech 20 times, 10 times, 15 times. I don't know what all of you are thinking right now. Oh my God, 20 times? That sounds like so much work. Not really. If your introduction's two minutes, this is a 30 minute exercise. Same thing with the conclusion, the last two minutes. What's a great movie with the terrible ending? Last time I checked, terrible movie. So same thing for the close. Do your close, your conclusion, 10, 20 times, and then tackle the middle. Whereas the issue right now, Tamar, is a lot of us, let's say we have a 40-minute presentation to give to a company or to employees. We might practice it once. We'll get lazy. We won't like what we presented. We'll have lunch. We'll forget about it and then present it the day of. We won't really practice it that much. Whereas with puzzle, what's nice is that same 40 minutes, you've already mastered your intro and then you build that momentum. You go, wow, this is the best intro I've ever delivered in my life. And that's what creates energy for you to practice. So just use puzzle the next time you give and deliver a presentation and you'll be way better at speaking. So I have a question about that. So are you saying that what is most memorable and correct me if I'm wrong, because this is what I'm I'm getting, is what's most memorable is to the audience would be how we start and how we end it. Or is it just a matter of us practicing it so well and fine-tuning it that we do build up momentum for the meat of the presentation? Excellent. And the answer tomorrow is actually both. Okay. So you're correct on both of those statements. So let's dig in deeper here. So the first statement that you mentioned is, Hey, like people remember the beginning of the end. This is absolutely true. Let me emphasize that even more. If your beginning sounds like this, Hi everybody, I hope you all, yeah, there's coffee in the back and uh, you can go get some coffee. We're just going to get started. Yeah, people are going to pretend to listen to you, but let's face it. Everyone's going to be on their phones, not really going to listen to what you have to say. They're not going to pay attention. Whereas if you start with, hi everyone, it's great to be here. You know, I want to tell you a quick story about how we came here today and you start talking about something, some patient situation or something that's aligned with whatever you're presenting. People are going to say, wow, okay, I need to pay attention to the rest of this. Like a podcast. If the first two minutes of a podcast are really boring, if I come on the show and I go, uh, yeah, it's good to be here tomorrow. Everyone's going to be like, I don't listen to this. Like what in the world is this? <laughs> so it's the same thing with the conclusion. 
if you do such a great job, but the last two minutes, you don't leave with something memorable. People don't leave with a clear takeaway. They won't really know what to do after the presentation. And the second piece that you tackled as well, momentum. And the same way with patients, if we do the same diagnosis 10 different times, we feel that momentum. Now I really know what I'm doing here. It's the same thing with presentations. The two minutes at the start is a quick way to gain momentum as well in speaking. Awesome. Thank you for clarifying that. I love it. Now, I'm, I want to talk about because you mentioned a little bit earlier about introverted professionals. So someone who's an introvert, they might have a more difficult time when it comes to public speaking. So what advice, Brendan, do you have to help them communicate more effectively? So the same tips still apply. RQV is still the advice, but let's add a little bit more nuance to that. So there's two parts to that nuance. The first part is video messages. Okay, if you're scared of sending this to like a stranger, just send it to your mom, send it to your dad, send it to your brother, some, your best friend. That's the best way to start. Or if you're super shy, you're saying you don't need friends, which I don't think is a possibility, but if it is, send videos to yourself. Okay, just send videos. No one's there. No one's going to judge you. No one's going to see these videos. Q, what's nice about the question drill? You don't have to do this with the group. It's literally, you're on your computer, you type up a question, you write out the answer, you open your phone, you get a voice recorder app, you say the answer, that's it, you're done. Nobody saw you even do the exercise. And R, random word exercise, best part, do this alone in front of the mirror when nobody's home. Okay, you don't have to do this in front of 10 people. That's the nuance. The second piece is understanding why introverts in some cases are actually better communicators. Because a lot of introverts I coach don't really realize that they're actually very talented in things that I had to spend years to get better at. Because I'm not an introvert, obviously. I'm obviously an extrovert. So there's three things. One, introverts are a lot better at pausing. So because they speak less on average tomorrow, it's very easy for them to take a breath and communicate a thought. Mm -hmm. Whereas me, as you can tell, that's why, you know, when I used to teach RQV, I actually would go on a ramble for 15 minutes and then I'd go, oh my God, like if I speak for 15 minutes, tomorrow's not going to be able to say anything. So I changed <laughs> my, because <laughs> I talk a lot. So that's why I guest on podcasts and I don't host them because <laughs> I would suck at being a podcast host. So that's number one <laughs> is pausing. Number two is introverts are really good at relating to their audience. So if you take somebody like Gary Vaynerchuk, for those who don't know, this is a pharmacy audience. He's like a, a big business entrepreneur. He's got millions of followers on social media. He runs a marketing agency. It's very successful. He's a very loud person. So you either really like him or you don't. But nobody says that about Brene Brown. When you hear Brene Brown give a talk, no one's going to say, I really hate this person. No, mm -hmm. everybody loves Brene Brown. Mm -hmm. And that's a really the key differences. And they're better listeners as well, obviously. Interesting. So better at pausing, relating to the audience and better listeners. So if you feel that you're an introvert, use those features, those skills or qualities as your superpowers to fuel you when it comes to public speaking and communicating with others. This is a very a useful information and practical. So I love it, Brendan. Now, are there any books that you would recommend for an audience to focus on to improve their communication and speaking skills? Yeah, for sure, Tamar. I would say the one that comes to mind that a lot of people don't recommend in my space, like because they just don't know of it, just a different approach to mm -hmm. speaking, is called Thirst by Scott Harrison. So Scott Harrison, and the book is called Thirst, T-H-I-R-S-T. And the background behind Scott is he's the founder of Charity Water. It's a nonprofit he started to help the world gain access to clean drinking water. He's one of my heroes. But mostly what I really like about the book and why people should read it is it's a practical case study of someone who used communication and public speaking as a vehicle to grow a multi nine figure brand. I think what he's done with Charity Water is really impressive from a storytelling perspective. And it's definitely a read for anyone who wants to really take their communication game to the next level. Awesome. Thank you. We can check out Thirst by Scott Harrison, guys. And uh, with that, Brendan, thank you so much for being our guest today. And we can all definitely benefit from these tips that you've shared with us from the QVR to the puzzle. And I absolutely love the puzzle analogy with just starting working around the edges first. It makes so much sense when it comes to presentations. Is there anything else that you would like to draw any pearls you want to drop with us before you go? Yeah, I would say the last piece tomorrow 
is just a question I'd leave your audience with, which is how would your life change if you're an exceptional communicator? You know, a lot of people, when we think of comms, we always think of it from a negative perspective. Oh, like I really need to get rid of my fear. Oh my God, this is so scary. And when we bring that energy to anything we do, it could be communication or anything else. Like for me, it's cooking, right? Like I hate cooking. So I'm really bad at it naturally. Whereas if you bring positive energy to that skill, like, hey, what if I was an exceptional communicator? What if I was the best pharmacist communicator in my city? How would my life be different? And just reflecting on it changes our energy around speaking from it being really negative to something that's really fun and exciting. And if we can develop that energy like kids do when you give them the random word exercise, that I feel is more than enough to set us off on the path of becoming great speakers. I love that. Thank you, Brendan. You know, when you actually another question pops in my mind. Because I'm I'm going back to thinking about the pharmacists that I've worked with and starting their working with them and starting their own um, health and wellness practices. A uh, underlying theme that I get from them is how to be authentic. So when they're speaking, especially if they have to be on social media, a lot of them have they don't want to be on social media because it's like the fear of being on camera and and you know what do I say? How do I say it? kind of thing. But then there's this authenticity. Am I being authentic? Um, Are people really going to see me? So what advice do you have for those who struggle with that? Here's the way I would spin it. Authenticity is something that you develop over time. So at the beginning, authenticity will look really bad. Like for me in 2019, it's like I'm a kid and my mom's like, literally, I'm a kid in my mother's basement, taking a phone out, not really having any clients, not just doing this for fun for my college buddies. That's how it starts. That's what authenticity means to me in 2019. And then as the years progress, now it's been five years, now it's more, okay, now I'm tailoring, authenticity means tailoring what I know to people and then making jokes so that I don't appear like I'm above everybody else, but that I'm on the same page as everyone else and I'm more relatable in that way. And then when you become even more advanced, it becomes adding small nuances in your communication to make you more relatable. So I did that a lot today in my communication where sometimes I'll I'll make a self-deprecating comment about myself. I'll say like, oh, you know, when I was doing, when I was in college, I used to do these things called case competitions, like professional sports for nerds. So that language is intentionally used to develop relatability for me. But this is the stuff that you've figured out over time. I think at the beginning, Tamar, the game, like when you started this podcast, It's more binary. It's should I do this or should I not do this? And I think the answer is really to just start the process and you figure it out over time. You start it, you just do it, you adjust, you pivot if you need to. Pivot if you need to. Well, thank you, Brendan. It's been a pleasure having you on. And I'm looking forward to hearing the feedback from the listeners and seeing who applies uh, what you've, you've taught us today. Thank you. Thank you, Tamar. This is great. Wow, what a journey we've just been on together. I hope your spirits are buzzing with excitement and your mind is flowing with new ideas on how to elevate your communication game. Remember, every word you share has the power to heal, inspire, and transform. Whether you're speaking to a patient, a colleague, or a room full of future professionals, your voice matters. Brendan Kumarasamy showed us that with the right tools and a dash of courage, we can all become master communicators. Now it's your turn to take these lessons and run with them. Keep practicing, keep pushing, and most importantly, keep believing in yourself because guess what? You have everything it takes to make a real difference in the lives of those you serve. So go ahead, step up to that microphone and the camera with confidence and let the world hear what you have to say. If today's discussion sparked a question or if there's a particular topic you love for us to cover, please reach out. This platform thrives on your feedback and curiosity, for it's together that will shape the future of healthcare. Your five-star review and comments can guide others on a similar journey. Subscribe, rate, and download this episode to ensure you're always in the loop. I'll talk to you next Friday. Until then, always remember in your journey as a healthcare professional, always raise the script on health because together we can bring healthcare to higher levels.